Hello everyone. This lecture features the salient features of endodontic microbiology from exam point of view for final years. In this lecture, we'll be covering the pathways of pulpal infection, in particular causes of pulpal exposure, then the association of microbes in pulpal and periodicular diseases, the different classifications of endodontic infections and the microbial ecology in root canal, specifically centering on microorganisms associated with endodontic diseases and their synergistic mechanisms. So when you see a microorganism infecting the pulpal tissue, there are different pathways or routes of microbial ingress. These are also known as the pathways of pulpal infection. These are namely dental caries which causes direct invasion of the pulp and its infection then via the dentinal tubules either due to exposure of uh, dentinal tubules due to trauma or leakage from a res uh, restoration or resorption. This can either be through gingival sulcus or periodontal ligament through which the bacteria penetrate through either the uh, dentinal tubules or the lateral canals. Then anachoresis or the retrograde infection of the pulp that is from the root portion where bacteria localize in the pulpal tissue from the retrograde region because of decrease in resistance of the tissues. Another way that microbes can ingress to the pulp are through a broken occlusal seal and faulty restoration of a previously endodontically treated tooth through salivary contamination. And finally, when an adjacent tooth is infected, the extension of the periapical infection from the adjacent infected teeth can also cause pulpal infection of that particular tooth. Now, let us come to causes of pulpal exposure. The commonest cause is dental caries. Apart from that, trauma which has resulted in pulpal exposure, then restorative procedure resulting in iatrogenic exposure of pulp, scaling and root planing procedures when they are doing root uh, deep root planing, there might be lateral canals which may lead to uh, ingress of bacteria. Severe attrition or abrasion cases will also result in pulpal exposure. Then there are certain congenital anomalies which can accelerate the pulpal exposures. These are namely dense invaginatus, dense evaginatus and palatal group, group defects. Once the microorganism breached the enamel and reached the pulp chamber via dentin, they overcome the host defense and invade the pulp and competing with mother, other organisms for nutrition and resisting the host defense finally reach the periapical region and cause an inflammatory response. So what is this inflammatory response? First, it starts with invasion of the bacteria into the pulp. There, when they find a conducive environment, they multiply and have a pathogenic activity which results in pathogenic response from the host. And this pathogenic response induces a damage in that localized region in response to microbes. Because of this sequelae of events, there is inflammation of pulp or pulpitis and it progressively leads to pulpal necrosis. Once the pulp is necrosed and microorganisms have a pathway to reach up to the periapical tissues and cause an infection there. Now what are the different types of endodontic infections? Broadly they can be classified into intraradicular and extraradicular. Intraradicular infections are further classified into primary, secondary, and persistent intraradicular infections, where extraradicular infections are based upon their causative microorganisms such as actinomyces 
and Propionibacterium propionicum. Intraradicular infection can be, as I said, primary intraradicular infection, which are mixed infection, predominantly caused by gram-negative anaerobes followed by gram-positive anaerobes. Secondary intraradicular infections are those which are either induced during treatment when you are treating the tooth for root canal or in between two appointments if there is leakage of the restoration or because of leakage of the obturating material or the restoration material after treatment. For secondary intraradicular infection, there are uh, certain specific microorganisms which can be considered responsible. These are P. aeruginosa, Enterococcus fecalis, Staphylococcus species, Candida species, etc. Finally, intraradicular infections which cannot be easily treated, they resist routine endodontic disinfection procedures are persistent intraradicular infections. So these are because of certain uh, fastidious microorganisms such as E. fecalis and certain fungi. What is the kind of microorganism that is associated with an endodontic disease? So the endodontic disease is typically polymicrobial and when a microorganism has to infect the canal, it has to have at least a concentration of 10 to the power of 2 to 10 to the power of 8 colony forming units to infect the root canal, depending upon its virulence. Now, in the oral cavity, these are low incidence bacteria, but when they come to the pulp tissue, then they become the pathogens. So, different types of microorganisms can be seen. These can be strict anaerobes, microaerophilic bacteria, facultative anaerobes, and obligate aerobes. Now, how do these microorganisms differ in the canal? Now, in the coronal portion, in the middle portion, and the apical parts of the canal, there is a difference in nutrient and oxygen tension. Because of this, the microflora also differs. So in the apical region where there is oxygen tension which is less and exogenous nutrition is not available, you have slow growing obligate anaerobes at the apical region. And there is also interaction between different bacteria which is known as bacterial synergy. Any microorganism which could not have survived earlier by itself by virtue of this bacterial synergy, is able to survive. This is also uh, called bacterial association, where nutrient demands of one species is met by the metabolism of the other species. The microbial ecology in the coronal part of the root canal is dependent upon exogenous nutrients such as carbohydrates, whereas in the middle and the apical portion, you have endogenous nutrients, which are the proteins and glycoproteins. So, depending upon what kind of nutrition the bacteria requires, in the coronal portion, there are different microorganisms found and the isolated organisms from the middle and apical thirds are different. Now, what is the synergistic mechanism between endodontic pathogens? It is actually an interplay of various factors. Uh, one microorganism might provide nutrition. The other microorganism, which is in close proximity to other microorganisms, will provide inhibition of phagocytosis, which benefits both the microorganisms which are close together. Then there will be secretion of growth factors and enzymes. And one microorganism, which requires oxygen for its metabolism, will result in decrease of local oxygen concentration which will facilitate another microorganism which can survive only in low concentration oxygen to survive. Now, different kinds of microbial associations are found. These typically, to name two, are between Fusobacterium nucleatum and P. micros, P. endodontalis, C. rectus and Selenomonas putigena. And another positive association is found between P. intermedia and P. micros, P. anaerobius and U. bacterium species. So, 
for you to remember fusobacterium nucleatum is found in abscess cases and in symptomatic and asymptomatic primary endodontic infection you will be able to isolate dialysis species in many of these infections now a few organisms you must remember as i said there are four types of organism that is gram positive cocci and rods and gram negative cocci and rods in gram positive cocci streptococcus species starting from angiosis then you have enterococcus fecalis and pepto uh, streptococcus species typically the micros and the anaerobia species in gram positive rods you must remember actinomyces israeli and u bacterium species and propionibacterium propionicum in gram negative cocci capnocytophaga species and vielanella parvula are the most important microorganisms which are isolated from the infected root canal among gram negative rods you have fusobacterium nucleatum and prevotella intermedia which must be remembered the endodontic microflora as i already said are predominantly gram negative anaerobes and the predominantly isolated bacteria are fusobacterium nucleatum but in infected root canals you will be able to isolate black pigmented bacteria which are associated with clinical symptoms such as pain tenderness on percussion and swelling typically in a particular type of infection you will be able to pre uh, isolate predominantly certain microorganisms such as in cases of endodontic failure we will be able to see enterococci and streptococci species in persistent periapical lesions uh, the organism which are responsible one of those are actinomyces again in a persistent apical periodontitis the fungal microorganism is candida in case of abscess one will be able to isolate spirochetes such as streponema and again in persistent root canal infection you will be able to see propionibacterium propionicum so for persistent root canal infection you can expect there to be p propionicum candida and actinomyces species whereas in cases of endodontic failure you will be able to isolate enterococci and streptococci now how do these microorganisms infect the root canal and escape the host defense the mechanism by which these microorganisms do this are known as the bacterial virulence factors one of them is the capsule which protects the microorganism from phagocytosis then is fimbriae fimbriae help in uh, many bacteria to aggregate together and fimbriae also help in attachment to the tissues present in the root canal maybe the dentinal tubules so they are not easy to remove from the canal then many organisms produce extracellular vesicles which are able to neutralize antibodies cause hemoaggregation and hemolysis and hence escape the host mechanism then you have certain microorganisms which release endotoxins such as lipopolysaccharides this results in complement activation and results in bone resorption now when lps is re uh, released this is typically uh, projected as pain or symptomatic teeth in patients then microorganisms may also release certain enzymes such as collagenase which will result in the breakdown of collagen and help in spread of infections such as cellulitis short chain fatty acids also induce bone resorption and help in spread of the infection caused by bacteria now let us discuss a few bacteria which are important from endodontic microbiology point of view now black pigmented bacteria now they are classified into species they are gram negative anaerobes seen in infected root canals and endodontic abscess and their pathogenicity is due to the presence of fimbriae capsules membrane proteins and endotoxic lipopolysaccharides typical examples of black pigmented bacteria which cause symptomatic 
infections and endodontic abscesses are P. nigrescens and Prevotella intermedia. Spirochetes are spiral microorganisms and the microorganisms responsible for root canal infection from the spirochete species are the Tryponema denticola and Tryponema socransky. These may be associated with osteoclastogenesis because of their virulence factors in root canal infections. Next, we come to the enterococcus species. Now, this is a very important short note question which can be asked about enterococcus as well as enterococcus fecalis. Now, these are not seen in primary endodontic infection, but they are very recalcurrent. So, when typical root canal cleaning and intracanal medicaments are used, they are able to resist that because E. fecalis can use serum as a nutritional source even if deprived of exogenous nutrients and because it has a proton pump the E. fecalis resists uh, change in pH by calcium hydroxide so if there is an alkaline pH the proton pump is able to pump in hydrogen ions within the canal resulting in maintenance of the intracellular pH moreover the E. fecalis is able to penetrate into the dentinal tubules. And hence, calcium hydroxide cannot reach those areas to kill these microorganisms. That is why E. fecalis is also known as the persistent persister. So, what are the virulence factors of E. fecalis? A short note can be asked on this. It endures prolonged periods of nutritional deprivation. So, even if the canal is sealed properly, it waits for the conditions to become conducive and then it will again start infecting the root canal. It binds to dentin and penetrates the dentinal tubules where it is difficult for intracanal medicaments to reach. It alters the host response and suppresses lymphocyte action. Therefore, it is able to escape phagocytosis. Apart from that, it processes lytic enzymes such as lipoticoic acid and pheromones and also utilizes serum as a nutrient source. As I said, because of the presence of a proton pump, it maintains the homeostasis within the intracellular region by pumping in hydrogen ions, even in the presence of alkaline intracanal medicaments such as calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide has reduced effect within dentin. And since, because of this, E. fecalis is able to escape the effect of calcium hydroxide when it is present in the dentinal tubules. It also can form a biofilm, which is more resistant to intracanal medicaments than individual microorganisms alone. Let us come to streptococcus species. Streptococcus is isolated in primary endodontic infection also. Microorganisms to remember are Streptococcus mitis and angiosis, anginosis. Their survival in root canal is due to their adaptive response to extreme environmental change. Therefore, a rigorous cleaning of the cleaning regime of the root canal is mandatory. Candida species have been recovered in 1 to 17 percent of infected root canal and they are seen in persistent apical periodontitis. The most frequently isolated species is the Candida albicans. Actinomyces is seen in root canals of retreated teeth. Typically, it is Actinomyces israeli. Lactobacillus is regarded as a transient contaminant and uh, its role in infection of the root canal is still not fully determined. They have been detected in teeth undergoing endodontic treatment and in root filled teeth with apical periodontitis. Now, after learning about these microorganisms, what is the significance of each microorganism when we are planning to do an endodontic therapy? When a microorganism is alone or is 
in synergy or association with another microorganism it may influence the disease severity making it more severe therefore the healing of the infection even after root canal treatment will decrease and uh, when we are doing over instrumentation these microorganisms may be extruded beyond the apex and can cause in fact more harm than good and uh, it is not necessary that all the microorganisms are responsible for periapical repair that is each microorganism if left behind it may not cause uh, bone resorption etc but it is definitely important that we should try our maximum to keep the canal clean so work in perfect isolation and uh, do copious irrigation place a good intra canal medicament and seal the canal properly in between appointments to prevent leakage of the restoration resulting in micro leakage of microorganisms into the root canal now once we have done our root canal treatment and obturated now 100% removal of the microorganisms is not possible so what happens when the microorganisms Uh, are remaining behind after obturation if they are present in very less quantity those which are first apically are normally disposed by body's defense mechanisms those microbes which are present in lateral and accessory canals may have one of the three fates one is they may remain alive but inactive so later on if the situation becomes conducive they may multiply or because of nutritional deprivation they may die out or the third option is that they may multiply utilizing debris from the lateral and accessory canals and cause an infection or a reinfection now this typically will happen when the root canal has not been instrumented and cleaned properly what is the treatment decision to go for when you decide that should i obturate the canal or not first criterion is the patient should be asymptomatic that is the tooth must be clinically symptomless the canal must be clean shaped and dry that is we must have done a proper cleaning and shaping and when we are uh, removing the dressing the canal should be dry without any exudate or blood on a routine basis it is not necessary to take a culture but only in severe abscess cases which are not resolving with our cleaning and shaping methods we should aim to bring down the microbial load to as low as possible to prevent future infections in case of uh, there is big abscess or cellulitis uh, before prescribing antibiotics it is advisable that we should go for microbial uh, microbial antibiotic sensitivity test and when we obturate we must make sure that the entire canal is sealed and the apical seal is done properly thank you very much